Um, I sense in this room that people would really want to talk about what's going on in the world today, and I promise uh, that I will uh, not uh, dominate this conversation and keep uh, from having questions. Um, but you're here also to talk about your book. And um, I, uh, I am substituting here for Dr. Breck Walker, um, who had uh, an emergency and was not able to make it today. And uh, but Breck did some preparation. And one of the questions that we would going to start with is on your book. Uh, namely, in your book, you talk about successful military leaders accomplishing four tasks. I wonder if you could expand on that and maybe provide um, the audience with the, uh, uh, the uh, very short, the, the summary of, of the main and essential arguments coming out of your book, which I should add also was written with the historian Andrew Roberts, who uh, it is a book in that sense, uh, as a historian myself, I can say it's a, it's a pleasure to see the idea of learning from history is still there. Well, you should know you studied for Ernie May, who uh, wrote the book Lessons of the Past, which was a big uh, influence on my own dissertation when I was uh, getting my own PhD at, at, at Princeton. And you know how much he put stock in at learning from the past uh, and trying to use it to illuminate the future. But as you know also, lessons of history can also obfuscate as well as illuminate. And the key is to figure out uh, when they're doing which. Uh, but first of all, let me just say thanks uh, to all of you. Thanks for the invitation to be with the World Affairs Council here. Uh, thanks for the reminder up front, by the way, that any one of us can be the most important person in another person's life at a given point in time. That is especially true on the battlefield, but it is true in everyday life as well. Uh, and that's actually a pretty important uh, message, I think, to keep in mind. Uh, thanks for escorting me around here and keeping me on schedule and everything else. It's just a very stern taskmaster here. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to be back in Music City. Uh, some of you know I had several assignments at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, ultimately Ooh. commanding the post uh, in the 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault. Uh, and uh, so it's wonderful to be back. And it's the third time this year, actually, so this is a bellwether year for that. Uh, Lloyd, or Lowell, thanks for the kind introduction. Night Stalkers Don't Quit, big guy. Uh, thanks for all that you did, especially at the controls of an MH-47, which is the most incredible aircraft. Uh, for those that don't recall it, the aircraft that actually took everybody over the mountains and the Hindu Kush and everything else into Afghanistan at the very beginning uh, was an MH-47. Uh, we could not have done so many missions over the years, particularly in the post 9 level wars, without you and your comrades in 160th Special Arms Aviation Regiment. Um, so the biggest of the big ideas uh, in the book really is about the importance of what we describe as strategic leadership. That's leadership at the very top. It's the civilian leader, President of the United States, Prime Minister of the UK, other national leaders. And then it's the commander of the theater of war, uh, the strategic commander, say, in Iraq or in Afghanistan. A strategic leader has to get perform four tasks right to have a chance to be successful. The same is true, by the way, in business. I mean, we just met earlier with a number of uh, CEOs and strategic leaders. And these tasks will be familiar to them. And this is actually an intellectual construct that I did, that developed between the three and four star commands in Iraq and then implemented during the surge in Iraq, then at Central Command, then in Afghanistan, then at the CIA. The first task is to get the big ideas right. This is far and away the most important uh, so you have to really understand the nature of the conflict, you have to understand the context in which you are going to carry it out, and you then have to craft the right strategic approach. You have to get that right. In fact, if you don't get that right, it doesn't matter how well you perform the other tasks that I'll describe, uh, which are normally what people think of when they think of leaders. Uh, if you don't get this right, everything else is building on a shaky foundation. And we described several cases, a number of cases in the book, where we did not get that right. Our American leaders didn't get it right, French leaders, other leaders did not get it right, and they suffered defeat uh, as a result. Uh, so first and foremost, get the big ideas right, get the strategy right. The second task is to communicate that effectively throughout the breadth and depth of the organization, ultimately to everyone who has a stake in the outcome of a particular conflict. 
The third is to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. This is what we normally think of as leadership. This is the example that the leader provides, the energy, the inspiration. It's attracting great people, hanging on to them, developing them. It's allowing those not measured enough to move on to something else. It's how you spend your time. Nothing's more important than that in which you spend your time, and that sends that message to everyone else who's watching. And so we had, for example, a very detailed, we called it a battle plan for my own personal spent expenditure of time. And it showed what I did every single day of the week. And we did many things every single day of the week. It's a seven day a week endeavor in combat. What we did several times a week, twice a week, once a week, every other week, monthly, all the way up to the quarterly six hour civil military campaign review that used to take six hours and was a grinding experience, but it was necessary to drive the execution of that campaign plan. And you've got to get the metrics right. You've got to understand what is it that will show us whether we're winning or losing, and you have to ensure that there's integrity in the reporting, deconfliction, clear definitions, and all the rest of that. We work every aspect of this and many, many more details uh, about this uh, with the surge in Iraq. And then there's a fourth task that is sometimes overlooked. In that task, you have to sit down formally. <coughs> events on your battle are going to force you to do this, uh, to determine how you need to refine the big ideas, make changes to your plans, and then do it all over again and again and again. Uh, the truth is that this is, again, very applicable in the business world. Um, a great example of this, of all things, is Netflix. Reed Hastings, the former CEO of Netflix, one of the great strategic leaders of our time, he helped that company invent itself and then reinvent it at least three more times. And we can go through it very, very quickly. Uh, first big idea was they looked around and they saw the blockbusters running movies from from brick and mortar stores, or some of us old enough to remember when that actually took place <laughs> in our world. Uh, it was a great joy to go there, uh, get one before the weekend. And they decided, you know what, we're gonna do this without brick and mortar, we're gonna undercut them, so we're gonna put movies in the hands of customers without brick and mortar, we're gonna mail them to customers. Pretty good big idea, worked out well. In fact, they ultimately put Blockbuster out of business. There's one left in Big Bend, Oregon. It's a famously <laughs> contrary in place. Uh, they refuse to let their, their blockbuster die, and now we can all go there because it's become a tourist attraction for all of us <laughs> who feel nostalgically about the ability to rent a movie for a good word. So anyway, but after a couple of years, and he works it, he communicates that he oversees the implementation, gets down here, and they sit down, what do we do now? Because others are now doing what they're doing. And he recognizes that there's a huge change in the strategic context. Broadband speeds have increased so dramatically that now he comes up with a big idea. We're gonna put movies in the hands of customers by having them download them. <coughs> Works that through, goes great, uh, and, but then others start doing that, so he has to come up with a new big idea. The new one was a really extraordinary one. We're gonna make our own content. $100 million on House of Cards alone, all the other iconic series that we all binge watched during the early months of COVID and rediscovered, um, so that works through. And then the fourth big idea, he decides, you know what, we're gonna make major motion pictures. And they go out and buy not one, but two major movie studios. And they do that so well, talking about a good metric, that they got more Academy Award nominations three years ago than any other major motion picture studio. Um, I did have one issue with him. I described, by the way, I discussed this strategic, uh, this construct uh, for the execution of strategic leadership with him. He has one that's very, very similar. Uh, not every term is the same, but it goes through the same process, and he does it explicitly, not just sort of implicitly. Um, but I did speak with him, and I said, you know, that movie that had Brad Pitt playing General McChrystal, my longtime combat friend, many years in combat together in Iraq, and then I was his boss when he was in Afghanistan, I said, you know, Brad Pitt didn't quite get Stan the Crystal. He marched around like a little toy soldier. He sort of saluted all the time. He, did, he had no sense of humor. Um, and I said, besides, I just cannot believe that Brad Pitt didn't play me. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the idea. And the idea is the critical component of strategic leadership in determining whether there is success or failure. And we looked at these different conflicts. Vietnam, we did not get the big ideas right until 1968. We've been there for over a decade. Um, the French, catastrophically bad big idea when they were in Indochina, as it was called then, 
they were frustrated that the communists wouldn't come to battle. So they decided, you know what, we're gonna put this big base way out, out in the countryside at this place called Dien Bien Phu. Uh, we'll make it really attractive. They'll finally come fight. By the way, as only the French could, they also had five little outposts that were named for the five mistresses of the current commander. <laughs> you know, this is the French. Uh, and yeah, no, they succeeded. I mean, the, the, the communists came to battle. Uh, of course, they defeated the French. The French had to surrender and had to leave it to China. Talk about getting the big ideas wrong. And we've had episodes where we've done certain things really well. You know, we attacked and Bill Hickman's here uh, over there, one of our great battalion commanders during the fight to Baghdad with the 101st Airborne Division. Topple the government, uh, you know, Saddam's flees, the government collapses. And then it turned out that our post-conflict planning was pretty inadequate, to put it mildly. And then we compounded that by two horrible big ideas firing the entire Iraqi military without telling them how we're going to enable them to provide for their families. Uh, so you create hundreds of thousands of individuals whose incentive is to oppose the new Iraq rather than to support it. And then we compounded that by firing all of the Ba'ath Party. Yes, it's Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party, I got that. But when you go all the way down to level four, it's basically the bureaucrats, uh, many of them Western educated and secular, that we actually need to run a country that we don't really understand. Uh, and yet we fired all of them as well. Now in our area, we were fortunate to get a special exemption only in our area to reconcile with them and put them to work, you know, getting Mosul University, 30,000 students back operation, all the, the ministries, the schools, plants, uh, all the rest of that. But again, we, it's, it, that is what we look at in this book. And uh, in some individual wars, again, we, we got parts right, not right, then right, I'd argue that the surge in Iraq very much got it right, and the results established that. You know, when you drive violence down by 90%, that's a pretty big achievement when a country is in a civil war to begin with. And then others where it, you know, it took us nine years to get just the inputs right in Afghanistan after a brilliant initial campaign that topples the Taliban, eliminates the Al-Qaeda sanctuary. But then we shifted focus and didn't really come back to it for many years. And it was not until late 2010, having gone in there in 2001, that we finally got the right big ideas, the right strategy, the right, almost the right level of forces, the right organizational architecture to implement that strategy, the right leaders, the right preparation of our forces, equipment, material, uh, and the other components of, again, getting the inputs right. But unfortunately, we only kept them right for about six months and started a drawdown uh, that was premature and then continued doing that, frankly, uh, until we prematurely left in the end uh, as well. So that's what we look at in this book, but we'll keep coming back. It's always about strategic leadership, just as it is uh, in the business world. Uh, the strategic leadership question, of course, though, um, it also hits uh, into our public opinion now, where we're in the middle of a political campaign. And one of the issues that's uh, at least is in the back of my mind is you can have the best strategic leadership, it would seem to me, but what happens if public support evaporates? Um, and I'm curious, how do you see the military leadership uh, dealing with the fact that American public opinion um, is, at, is volu valuable, changeable, um, subject to political leaders who exploit particular issues um, and that the old-fashioned consensus on foreign policy has diminished considerably in recent years. Yeah, welcome to the real world. Uh, and again, deal with it. You have to understand the context in which you're operating. And again, there is a strategic leader above the level of an individual combat endeavor. I worked for two of them. Um, one of them went all in uh, on what it was that we were doing. Um, one of them had a you know, you want to show that your, your priority is the President of the United States? Start a meeting on Monday morning at 7.30 a.m. with your entire national security team around and do a video conference with the commander and the ambassador who are leading that particular effort, which is what George W. Bush did when we conducted the surge every single week. And then the next day, he did a meeting with the Prime Minister of Iraq uh, at the same time. By the way, nothing in Washington on a Monday morning starts before 10 a.m. in the White House. I mean, not with, with the President, I mean. Uh, you look at the official schedule, they publish it. You know, somewhere around 9 or 10, the intel briefer might come in or something like that. 
This is 7.30 in the Monday morning. And I think about when the poor action officers had to get up on Sunday night and begin gathering all the material and going through the report that we used to send Bill was with me on that tour as well, uh, that you send back you know, to, to Washington on Sunday night and they have to go through it. They have to prep their boss who preps his boss who then finally briefs the chairman of the Joint Chiefs or the Secretary of Defense. Um, so again, but welcome to that world. Uh, some commanders in chief have had that kind of uh, emphasis, that kind of access, that kind of interaction, and then others have not. And I experienced, you know, sort of unique in that regard. I think the maybe the only living American who commanded two wars. Um, and again, there are different styles, different levels of commitment, and so forth. And what you have to do is understand that, and then figure out how you can do the best that you can do with the resources and priority and all the rest of that you're, that you're provided. Um, I will note that it's a lot easier to do it when you're building up than when you're drawing down. And I was very fortunate to be there, you know, for, but although we did draw down the surge forces before uh, I actually came home on that tour. But, but again, there is also a degree to which a military leader can contribute to reasoned and informed debate. But the military, the role of the military is not to be political, it's not to help one party or the other, it's not to help the party in power, it's to provide your best professional military advice based on the facts on the ground, and awareness of all the other issues with which a president legitimately has to deal. They, you know, they are, they do have to get reelected, they do have to worry about budget deficits, they do have to worry about congressional politics, alliance politics, strain on the force, opportunity cost of forces in Afghanistan, rather than in the Indo-Pacific. But uh, the military commander's job, again, is to take what it is that he's provided after having uh, provided the best professional military advice and do the absolute best that you can. And in that regard, what you've got to do is perform these four tasks, and you've got to do it right, uh, or else you're not going to prevail in a particular conflict. I know that one of the areas in which you see these four tasks as having been performed in a particularly effective way is the war in Ukraine. And I'm wondering if you might want to talk a little bit about how your model um, is was activated. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could compare and contrast, but, but we should note it's incomplete. I mean, the, this war is not over. Uh, and the, the future trajectory depends on a number of different factors, one of which is U.S. willingness to continue to support. Now, I believe personally, and I'm no longer in uniform, uh, although I'm non-political, I should just note, I don't even register to vote, much less vote. I haven't since I was promoted to two stars at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, in fact. Um, but there clearly is a question in, in some part of one party, in particular in the House of Representatives, about the, the uh, wisdom of continuing to support. I believe that this is about as right versus wrong as it gets in the world in our lifetime, when a huge neighbor led by a, a kleptocratic leader with all kinds of historical grievances and revisionist, revanchist history involving his neighbor Ukraine, which he believes doesn't have a right to exist, and then it invades in a brutal and unprovoked manner, I think that we should come to the rescue uh, of that country, <coughs> particularly because, again, what, they're the ones doing the fighting and dying. They're fighting their war of independence. This is their war of survival. Um, we are enabling to do that, um, and they are doing it quite magnificently. And so you compare and contrast the the strategic leadership of President Zelensky of Ukraine and President Putin of Russia. Uh, Zelensky, his very first action, uh, his first big idea is, I don't want to ride, I want ammunition. That's a pretty good big idea. I'm going to stay in Kiev. I'm not going out to the West <coughs> where they're offering me a ride. Uh, my family's going to stay here. We're going to defend Kiev to the end. And every male in Ukraine is going to stay in the country. <coughs> Those are pretty powerful big ideas, and he communicates them brilliantly. Of course, he's a former actor. You know, he was a comedian who played the president. He did it so well that he actually got elected president. <laughs> and to be truthful, his first two and a third years in office weren't that distinguished. They, he had modest accomplishments. He was elected to reform a whole host of ills that have prevented Ukraine from being all that it could be. Uh, to combat corruption and inadequate rule of law and monopolistic powers of oligarchs in certain sectors, et cetera. Uh, and I've spent a number of, I've done many, many trips to Ukraine over the years, including two just in the last five months. Um, but his communication skills were extraordinary. I remember he addresses the House of the Parliament, uh, House of Commons, 
uh, in the UK, our Congress, the first wartime leader to address both houses of Congress since Churchill did it during World War II, uh, the Bundestag, and in each case he communicates just beautifully to the specific audience with allusions to the different histories of the different countries. Truly Churchillian uh, when he was addressing the audience in, in London. Uh, and then his example, think about this. You know, he changes out of a suit, puts on an OD sweatshirt, which he's worn ever since, uh, variations on the theme, uh, along with many of the members of his, the equivalent of his White House staff. Uh, he goes to the front lines, <coughs> sitting at the long end, end of a long table, all the minions are down there somewhere, and they almost have to have a microphone to be heard by where he is. Zelensky's up in Bakhmut, uh, he's down in Zaporizhia, he's on the front lines repeatedly. Uh, and again, a whole host of other ways in which he has very effectively uh, executed the task of a strategic leader, including periodically refining those tasks and doing it again and again and again. And that, that leadership, along with the extraordinary courage and determination and skill uh, of his men and women in uniform, enabled them to win the Battle of Kiev. Uh, remember, they came at him both from Belarus and from Russia, huge forces, and they stopped them cold, and then they forced them actually to retreat. They were losing so many uh, armored systems. Very effective defense. Uh, there's another battle of Sumy and Chernihiv in the northeast, and Kharkiv in the east, second largest city. Kharkiv province, they retook all of that last year. And then the, all the forces of Russia that made it west of the Dnipro River, which goes from north to south of the country, forced them to withdraw those uh, east of the river as well. But the summer offensive this uh, year has not achieved what, what they hoped, what a lot of us hoped they would. Um, we didn't provide them the air power soon enough. Our tanks didn't arrive in time. A lot of the other systems, they didn't have enough armor breaching systems. And then to be fair, the Russian defenses are vastly more substantial and more formidable than anyone expected. Even with overhead imagery and all the open source and everything else, people didn't realize that these minefields are miles deep, not just hundreds of meters deep, and that the density of the mines is double what it normally should be. All, all the, the, these other uh, aspects. And so, again, it's incomplete. And again, it depends very much on continued US support. I believe strongly that should continue. You know, if a democracy, however, flawed and imperfect is invaded without provocation by uh, a country like Russia, which is the whole reason NATO exists uh, and is fighting that country, uh, we should do everything we can to enable them. And our European partners actually now have pledged more security assistance at this point than we have. And we've given a lot, 44 billion is a lot, but out of a defense budget over a two year period, that is, uh, you know, say 1.7 trillion. I think we can more than afford that. And by the way, you know, I'm, as you noted uh, in the introduction, I'm a partner in one of the world's largest investment firms. We are understandably concerned about issues like return on investment. And the ROI on this, 44 billion plus a similar amount from the EU, and they've actually taken 60% of the Russian tank fleet out, dramatically reducing the threat to NATO Europe. That's not a bad return on investment, uh, and we should continue to support them, just as we should support, obviously, uh, our Israeli partners uh, and allies in, in what it is that they're combating uh, against an extremist army that is akin to the Islamic State and not, some, not an entity with which you can reconcile. Well, I wanted to turn to the Middle East, and I'll preface this question by saying yesterday on NPR, one of your former aides, Peter Mansour, was on and was asked about a time he had actually gone to Israel to talk about the lessons from the siege to the Israelis. And one of the lessons from the siege, the, the, surge. Surge, the surge, excuse me, surge, uh, the, uh, the, uh, one of the lessons from the surge was the idea of needing uh, partners, needing uh, uh, groups that are willing to work with you even if they have blood on their hands, in effect. And the Israeli uh, officials that he met with then uh, found that very hard to accept. I'm curious in your analysis of what's going on and, uh, in, in Gaza, your famous question, well, what do we do now? Or where does this, uh, how does this yeah, end? Tell me how this ends. Tell me how this ends. How do that you was the question from, you know, during the fight to Baghdad. Um, we could see that the assumptions that we've been provided were being invalidated one by one. The idea that we were eventually going to be able to topple the very top of the structure but have everybody else stay in place 
uh, just was, I mean, we did the first big city liberation, nausea. In fact, I walked with his battalion uh, part of that time. That's when I became incredibly impressed by his leadership. And uh, he should know that he then, the night before he was supposed to return to his wife, who was here, and he, thank you for the, that sacrifice yet again. He's going to change command the next day. He's going to go home that night and go to the war college, and they're going to have a wonderful year together. And I called him and I said, hey, I'd like you to stay on afterwards and be the G3 of the division, the chief of operations, plans, and training, the most important job for lieutenant colonel in the division. Uh, and he said, absolutely, and and then came back. Right, then he went to, he did go to the War College eventually. It brought him over right after that. When I was a three-star, he was a brigade commander for the 101st during the surge in Iraq, did a magnificent job, 15-month tour that time. And then as soon as he got out of that, I brought him to Central Command to be my executive officer, and then when I got the call on very, very short notice to be the commander in Afghanistan, he was waiting outside the White House, and my first question on hopping back into the SUV was, hey, Bill, you got any plans for the next year? <laughs> and he came along on that as well, and then did one more tour around the Middle East, so an extraordinary uh, individual. But we could see that these, these assumptions were being invalidated, and so I, I had an embedded reporter, uh, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner, Rick Atkinson, and I got two comfortable with him forgetting that you're always on the record and I started saying tell me how this ends with an ex with a question mark and I heard that question for many many years after that <laughs> in many congressional hearings um, look first let's set the context for Gaza because this horrific barbaric uh, unspeakable uh, attack by uh, Hamas extremists that killed 1400 uh, Israelis and uh, other citizens for a country of 9.3 million people, um, that would equate, if you had it in our country, uh, that would be over 50,000 killed. And by the way, there were many, many more that were wounded or injured. And so you'd have, you'd have over 50,000 killed and hundreds, over 100,000 wounded and injured, uh, to put it in our scale. Keep in mind the 9-11 attacks, we lost not quite 3,000. And then the 240 hostages, would be way over 7,000. So think about that, again, from our perspective, and then I think you can start to put yourself in the shoes uh, of the Israelis. Clearly a terrible intelligence failure, a terrible military readiness failure uh, that led to an inability to respond as quickly as they should have. So a lot that will be looked at in the post-mortem. But uh, the determination was that their previous strategy is no longer valid. The big idea used to be that what you do in Gaza, because remember they pulled out of Gaza in 2005, left it to the Palestinians. Uh, there was an election in 2006 which the U.S. encouraged. It didn't come out the way we hoped it had. Hamas won, and then they basically got rid of the, the, uh, the other uh, Palestinian party, uh, which generally prevails in the West Bank. Uh, and they've never had an election since in true authoritarian fashion. And they have periodically carried out various attacks on uh, his, the Israeli towns and villages nearby occasionally, but longer than that with rockets, mortars, sometimes individuals coming out of tunnels and so forth. And the Israeli response was to mow the lawn. You go in and you do a certain amount of damage. You don't take all of it. You don't go too deep into the urban areas because it's very challenging. Um, and that gives you a few years of relative calm and then, then something happens and you do it again. That clearly has been invalidated. And so the determination has been made, and I agree with it, that they have to destroy uh, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, their junior partner, another extremist group, that these are the equivalent of the Islamic State. Yes, it's an imperfect analogy because there's some Palestinian nationalism caught up in all of this that wasn't present with the Islamic State. But just as the determination was made that the Islamic State had to be destroyed when it established the first ever caliphate centered on Mosul in northern Iraq and Raqqa in northeastern Syria, that determination has been made with respect to Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. Now destroy in military terms, and I know we have a lot of veterans in here who will remember that that means to render the enemy incapable of accomplishing his mission without reconstitution. Keep without reconstitution in mind because we're gonna come back to that. That may be the biggest challenge of all. Uh, to destroy an enemy means that you have to go into every building, every floor, every room, every cellar, every tunnel, and there's 300 miles of tunnel underneath uh, Gaza City that make this particularly fiendishly difficult. 
There are 240 or 239 now, I think, hostages still uh, believed in Hamas hands. They'll be used as human shields. Civilians are used as human shields. They do fight without uniforms. Uh, they fight from civilian areas. They're preventing the civilians, in some cases, from following the direction of the Israelis who have sent hundreds of thousands of leaflets, text messages, and phone calls to say, move out of Gaza, get to the south. You know, you're sitting on top of a Hamas headquarters. By the way, they put their headquarters underneath uh, refugee camps, the hospital, uh, store weapons and mosques. All of these are all clear violations uh, of the laws of land warfare. So you cannot imagine a more challenging situation against an enemy that is, however barbaric and, 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 and uh, participated in horrific actions, is quite a formidable uh, enemy and knows the area exceedingly well and has probably been planning for this moment for months, if not years. Uh, so this is gonna be very, very hard. There will be individuals among Hamas and Islamic Jihad who will blow themselves up to take Israelis with them. That's a particularly pernicious challenge. Those in, in the audience here who fought against enemies like that, remember that you then have to keep everyone at arm's length, literally, you, anybody in bulky clothing, any vehicle that doesn't obey your direction you're gonna to have to take action against them, it may be to, to uh, shoot them. So you cannot imagine a more challenging situation. Uh, they're, they're setting the conditions, preparatory fires have now basically isolated Gaza City and all of northern Gaza. They cut right across the, the center uh, of north and south Gaza and then they've been coming in from the uh, northwest and northeast. And again, surrounded, they're now getting into Gaza City itself. And this is a city originally of about 1.3 million people. This is not a trivial task. And keep in mind, again, veterans here who have cleared major urban areas and know that you don't just clear and go on to the next, the next building. You have to clear and hold. You have to leave forces behind or the enemy re-infiltrates behind you and you're fighting 360 degrees. So it consumes uh, personnel as well because you have to leave a sufficient force that they can defend themselves if they have to and can't get swarmed and turned into hostages uh, to add to the 240 they already have. Very, very, very tough. I believe they can destroy uh, Hamas, but it's not gonna be easy and it remains to be seen. I do believe that they will be able to do that. They're incredibly skilled with lots of technology uh, and so forth. The challenge is then what? It's the same question that we had after we got to Baghdad and toppled the regime. It's actually the question we had when we got to Najaf. We cleared the first major city in Iraq, uh, 400,000 or so, the holiest city in Shia Islam. And I remember calling my boss and I said, hey boss, I got good news and bad news. Good news is we own Najaf. What's the bad news, he asked. We own Najaf, what do you want us to do with that? And he said, call those guys down in Kuwait that said, I asked down in Kuwait, if final meeting. I said, can you get us a little more detail on what happens when we get to Baghdad and top of the regime? And they said, you just get us to Baghdad, Dave, we'll take it from there. That did not prove out. That was not adequate. Um, and they didn't certainly didn't come help us. We had to leave an entire brigade behind. So the question is, who's going to administer Gaza? Can you get a, for, you know, the ideal would be you bring a competent, capable, dependable force uh, from the West Bank, Palestinian Authority come over. It just doesn't exist. Um, you can question whether the force is there, even in the West Bank, is, is competent and capable and trustworthy. Um, could you get an Arab force to come in? Certainly try. The problem is, come back to that mission. Without reconstitution, you have to keep an eye on Hamas remnants and Islamic Jihad. There will be remnants. There's no escaping that. And so who's going to keep an eye on that? And right now, I think the conclusion is, uh, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, at least that they may have to do that, even though they don't want to do it. And Washington is caution cautioning them against doing it. Uh, and obviously, the optics of what's going on in this fight are very, very rugged. There's lots of innocent civilian lives that are lost. That happens in urban combat. You have to keep that to an absolute minimum. And at the end of the day, what about the tens of thousands of essentially bureaucrats, or, or really government workers, that actually know how to turn the lights back on and repair the water and, and infrastructure and reopen markets, schools, clinics, and all the rest of that, um, can you reconcile with them? You can't reconcile with Hamas, but can you, with the rank and file, again, like the Ba'ath Party members that were the bureaucrats, 
that we did reconcile with up in, uh, in most, but that was the only area until the surge when we did it much more broadly, and that's what uh, Dr. Piedmont sort of captures in his superb book, The Surge. Uh, noting again, he had a pretty good vantage point because he was my executive officer and he had a PhD from history and was number one in his class at West Point. So uh, that's the real challenge, and that has not yet been resolved. Our Secretary of State and, and other leaders have been flying the wings off their jet all around the region trying to find out a way to administer Gaza uh, in a way that would ensure the security of Israel, which has gone through this incredibly traumatic experience and is determined <coughs> never again in this case. Again, this is the single worst loss of life since in the day since the Holocaust for the Jewish people worldwide. Um, and that's the real challenge. I think it's all about the day after it's the post-conflict phase and how you sustain the gains that they have made to ensure that Iran is not able to breathe new life back into Hamas and Islam Jihad, and there's a couple of other uh, groups as well, uh, to enable them to come back and to render all the sacrifice and, and loss and so forth and damage and destruction um, irrelevant. Now let me, let me uh, I, I promise, that the audience have questions, but you, you raised the, the issue at the end, Iran. Um, Americans uh, in Syria and Iraq have been attacked by uh, proxy forces of Iran. Uh, Hezbollah um, also is attacking a proxy Southern, force Southern of Iran. Mm -hmm. um, is American policy toward Iran, should American policy, as, as some commentators recently suggested in articles, should be directed toward regime change? Should, should we change our policy toward Iran to a more militant and defiant one uh, than the one we have? Well, regime change is pretty militant and defiant, and we have some experience with regime change. Um, Iraq and Afghanistan doesn't always turn out the way you hope it might. Uh, it's pretty destructive, and uh, it's hard to predict how it will turn out. We also have seen in the Arab Spring countries, not a single one of them has actually turned out well now that Tunisia has sort of eroded into authoritarianism as well. Libya is still essentially in a civil war. Uh, Egypt is basically back on a military authoritarian system. At least it's stable and so forth. Uh, but it went through a period with the Muslim Brothers in charge that was quite unsettling for the region and for us. Uh, Syria is still sort of in a civil war. Uh, certainly doesn't control the whole country. Yemen is in a civil war. So again, I think we have to, among the many lessons we should take from our post 9-11 wars is I think a degree of, if you will, humility in what it is that we can bring about. This doesn't mean that we should not exercise leadership in the world. I think we should and have to, and no, if we don't, no one will. And we don't do that for charity, by the way. This is not to help others around the world, although it happens to. This is because it's in our national interest to do so. The reason that, that our system has been preserved, despite all the challenges we have, some of them domestically, uh, just, and the reason that we are as prosperous as we are is because of the so-called rules-based international order that was established in the wake of World War II by the US and the other victors of World War II, and for all of its imperfections over the years, and they are many, uh, it is still better than what the alternative would be. And there are other countries in the world that are trying to undermine it to make the world safe for their particular system of governance and, uh, and politics and economics, which would be antithetical to ours. Um, but when you come back to Iran, I think those that think you could easily overthrow a regime that at, at its core is millions of people. This is not Egypt where they're gonna let, uh, you know, they could let Mubarak go under the bus and the military could still keep all their jobs and perks and 30% of the economy and, and all the rest of that. In Iran, if the regime goes, it's the entire country collapses, and they're not gonna let it happen. Um, you have all kinds of uh, security forces that will preclude that, all the way down to the basically the two million pipe-swinging thugs, the besieged militia, that they can call out on the streets if they really have to, and they can arm them uh, if need be as well. So I, I'm just a bit cautious. I think, again, that we should be a bit measured in our aspirations when it comes to uh, overthrowing regimes that we don't like. Now, let me tell you, that, you know, rule number one of the Middle East is know who your enemies are and who your friends are, and Iran is an enemy. Israel's a friend. Uh, but that doesn't mean that 
you can do something like that easily, efficiently, quickly, and successfully. And in fact, I have some questions about how something like that might turn out. And I know that the cost would be extraordinary. So uh, again, now, can we be more firm? Can there be various actions we can take? Certainly, those you can debate. Uh, and that's not as clear cut either. Um, none of these, these are all very difficult. There's no optimal solutions. Um, in fact, right now, for example, you could s slap major sanctions back on Iran. They're exporting about 1.5 million barrels of oil a day and still relatively tight oil market of about 100 million barrels a day. Um, and you know, the people that are urging you in Washington to be tough on Iran will be the first to criticize you if the price of gasoline goes up, which it will. So again, there's nothing easy about any of this stuff. The same about the Iran nuclear deal, frankly. Um, it, had, it had shortcomings without question, but it also had some major benefits. And by removing the, the, the um, by us withdrawing from the agreement, uh, the result is, frankly, that Iran is closer to weapons-grade uranium enrichment than it ever was and certainly much, much closer than it was under the agreement, again, noting there were some shortcomings to it. I think now is the time to um, open this up to the audience. Uh, we, you, there are a few topics we haven't gotten to yet, including uh, China and the Pacific, but um, I'd like to- We to hope invite. students will be the first ones to put their hands up, by the way. So, so the Belmont, so. Belmont president and others are all taking notes right now to see <laughs> uh, which of you are gonna get the- I have a question over here. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> right there. Yeah. I guess you're going to have to use your command voice. Uh, I wanted to ask you, with your vast experience in dealing with people, how do you deal with difficult people and one example would be the president of Afghanistan? Um, you know, you, you have to exercise patience. Uh, obviously, I dealt with uh, a president who had been in office for quite a while had, had accumulated a fair amount of frustration with uh, <coughs> previous commanders and, and, uh, and frankly mistakes that we made on the battlefield killing innocent civilians. Um, but you know, you have to, you don't get to choose your host nation partners. Um, occasionally you do if you want to overthrow the previous ones like we did in Vietnam, but even that actually didn't, it ended up with turmoil for a number of years before a fairly stable uh, set of president and premier was selected. So you, again, you, you have to try to understand the situation that individual is in. You try to shape the views. You try to work on the issues that have to be resolved. Um, although there were times when President Karzai was frustrating, uh, and I knew his successor, Ashraf Ghani, actually I had admiration for Ghani. He seemed to be very, he was a highly intelligent, um, very energetic, had vision and all the rest of that, but it turned out that he got on the helicopter and flew out of the country when his country most needed him. Uh, that was a case of strategic <coughs> leadership that obviously uh, didn't exactly get the big ideas right in some very serious ways. Um, but you, as always, what you do is try to make the best of the situation uh, determine what really, really is important. In my case, when I took over in Iraq, we needed to get a reconciliation program going. We needed anti-corruption programs. We needed to amp up the counter-narcotics program. You know, it's really tough to have rule of law in a country if their major export crop is, is opium products. <laughs> um, we needed uh, also to uh, have an Afghan local police program. Some of you in here may have been involved. We should have done it five years earlier. We should have done a lot of things earlier in Afghanistan. As I noted, we didn't get the inputs right in Afghanistan for nine years after a brilliant uh, initial campaign. Um, and, and then again, you just have to work with and around and sometimes through and, and all the rest of that uh, a leader. But that's not uncommon. Um, Prime Minister Maliki was uh, not the easiest of, uh, if you will, national leaders to deal with in Iraq when I was commanding the surge. In fact, an episode very early on. So I went over, I, uh, you know, I, I actually ended up going six months earlier than I thought I was gonna go back. I'd been told after I came home from the three-star tour that I'd likely go back in the summer of uh, 2007. I ended up going back in very early February. 
And I got over there, and the, the first, I've been tracking it very closely because I, again, expected to go back. We'd done the counterinsurgency field manual, it overhauled all of the commission, non commission, warrant officer, uh, professional education programs for uh, our leaders to prepare them more for this kind of scenario than we were. We overhauled the National Training Center location, all of this work. And I get there and I take over on the first day, of course. And then the second day, I said, I want to go out into Baghdad. I want to see it for myself. And we went to about four or five different places. Frankly, I was horrified. I hadn't realized how really bad it was. I mean, the damage and destruction were just horrific. It, the, the city was in a full on Sunni Shia civil war. There were 53 dead civilian bodies every 24 hours due to violence in Baghdad uh, the month that the president decided to conduct the search. It was, it was again, a, a city, that, a capital that was out of control. And then the third day, uh, I was called by the National Security Advisor of Iraq, who I knew really well because I had basically written the National Security Strategy for Iraq in a previous tour with him. Uh, and he called me in together with the Serbian ambassador, it wasn't yet the great ambassador Crocker, who was the greatest diplomatic partner any soldier ever had. Uh, and he said the prime minister has, I think it was 11 or 12 demands. And he listed these, he laid them all out. And I realized these are the exact opposite in every way of what it is we intend to do and need to do. Because if we don't, uh, this, he essentially wanted to continue doing what we had been doing, but to do it even faster to get out of the neighborhoods even faster, our forces, hand off to the Iraqis even faster, even though the strategy was failing. And I said, doctor, let me get this right. The situation is failing. The President of the United States has decided to conduct a surge. And you want to continue doing what we're doing, but accelerate it. So you want to fail faster? And I said, with great respect, if that's truly what the Prime Minister intends to do, I would appreciate him telling that to the President tomorrow on the normally scheduled video conference that you'll have which I understand I, I attend together with the ambassador. It will be my first meeting. But he should know that if he does tell that to the president, uh, that he's going to implement that strategy without me because I'm gonna be on the next plane to Washington and I will take the policy with me. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, my blood is pumping through my body. It's, a, you know, it's that flush feeling that you feel I, maybe a few times in my entire life. Uh, and I didn't sleep that night, needless to say. We go to the video conference the next day. I never hear anything of it again. And we go ahead with what we're going to do, which is to completely reverse what it was we were doing. Uh, you know, change leadership, people talk about all the time. It doesn't get any bigger than 180 degree reversal. <laughs> uh, and that's what we did. And that's what enabled us to drive violence down by nearly 90% in 18 months. Um, so, but he then became quite a good partner. I mean, there were very, it was very, very difficult. There's enormous challenges at various moments, but you, all you can do is the best you can do. Uh, you try to avoid what we would call non-biodegradable moments. I mean, you don't ever so totally lose it. I would occasionally go to a meeting, and in advance, I would tell my translator and the ambassador, because we would always go together, that I'm gonna, this is going to be a full range of emotions meeting. If you think I'm, I'm no longer acting, so you, you act. But if you actually get really wound up, and you can't, this is life or death. I mean, these are big, big issues, and our soldiers are dying for that country. Uh, if, you, if, you get, if you lose control of your emotions, then you might say something that you'll regret for the rest of that relationship. And then and the job of my translator was to pluck my sleeve if he thought I was losing it, truly losing it, not just acting losing it, uh, to make sure that I didn't go that way. Uh, so these are, this is, this is tough stuff. Uh, it's not for the weak or faint hearted. <laughs> Next question, I think there was one right, yeah, right there. Just go ahead and shove. Uh, afternoon, sir, thank you. First off, thank you for being here. Uh, secondly, uh, your rock assaults. Yeah, aerosol. Aerosol. Third question, what would you say to the events um, when we hear we're gonna have boots on the ground again in the sand, especially after the way we pulled out of the pool? generation and the next generation's thoughts and feelings when it comes to the U.S. military and intervention? I don't think we are, actually. I think we're, I think we're going to work very hard not to do that. What's interesting is Israel does not want American boots on the ground. Ukraine doesn't want American boots on the ground. They all know that the, the consequences of that um, are uncertain. Uh, 
they would rather control that themselves. Uh, but that's not to say that, I mean, we do have boots on the ground in Iraq and Syria. They are being shot at by Shia militia supported by Iran. Thankfully, touch wood so far, there have been no fatalities. There have been over 40 wounded, I think generally lightly wounded. Um, but I don't, I don't see any way in which we would put boots on the ground in Israel. Uh, it's very hard. I mean, I guess I could conjure up some kind of existential moment, that, but it'd be a big stretch. So I just don't see that happening. Beyond that, look, I think that, you know, the reason that people serve is because it is a privilege to perform a mission that is larger than self. That's particularly true when your country is at war. And I, I believe, for example, that the generation that volunteered to serve in our military in the wake of the 9-11 attacks should be recognized as America's new greatest generation. Uh, they raised their right hand, took an oath of service at a time of war, knowing that they're gonna be asked to deploy to combat. And many of them re-enlisted. I, I presided over the largest re-enlistment ceremony in history, we believe. And where do you think it was? It wasn't at Fort Campbell or Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, now Fort Liberty, it was in Baghdad in the second year of the surge on July 4th. I mean, Baghdad, seriously? They're re-enlisting, knowing that they're gonna, if by doing that, because then we were doing 12 months, actually we're doing 15 months, they were doing 15, I, my tour was a 19 and a half month that time. But they knew that they're gonna go home, be there less than a year and be brought back to either Iraq or to Afghanistan. And yet there they were, and why were they doing it? Because it's a privilege to serve a mission as far as yourself, to do so with a community that feels the same way, uh, and to have the sense of identity that comes from wearing America's uniform, especially again at, at a time of war. Um, I think that still is the case, and I hope that the propensity to serve uh, can actually increase, because obviously right now it's a very challenging recruiting landscape if you have historically low unemployment. I mean, I talked to a lot of the business leaders who were here earlier, they can't find enough workers. So the military is competing uh, for the individuals, and there's a limited pool of people that have a high school degree, don't have a criminal record, are in reasonable physical condition, and don't have uh, uh, other limiting factors. So um, again, I, I think there's something very special about it. Our son, sir, um, surprised us. You know, he didn't go to MIT to, it was an ROTC, he joined the second year, he called us up, said he just joined. He was a rifle platoon leader on the ground with the 173rd Airborne Brigade when I was a, the commander in Afghanistan. Then he went back several more times with special ops. Our daughter-in-law served. You know, she was at Harvard, of all places, and did MIT ROTC and was under a rucksack in, in Afghanistan with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, by the way, out with patrols as a female engagement team leader, and they felt very privileged to do that. So again, I, I think it's something very special I think those that have it, it's an experience. We're all going to celebrate that tomorrow. Actually, some are celebrating today, uh, but Veterans Day. Uh, and that is a moment indeed to say thank you for your service to people, especially those uh, who served in the wars of the post 9-11 period. Other questions? Michael, one more question. Okay, how about the, right there. Well, sir, uh, i just like to say <coughs> thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Privilege. Uh, Look, I, I come back, I think that anybody who served, especially in the post 9 11 period, uh, did so very nobly. Uh, 
doing it to serve our country at a time of war is very, very special. And the outcome of that doesn't diminish that in any way. I disagree. I, again, I said I'm not political. That doesn't mean I don't have views and I don't express them. I just don't get involved in political campaigns um, or in d domestic politics. But I felt that we should have stayed. I, we only had 3,500 troops there. We hadn't lost a soldier in 18 months. Yes, Afghanistan was frustrated as all get out. Yes, it was imperfect. It was uh, maddeningly so. Um, yes, our Pakistani, quote, partners were beyond frustrating. They wouldn't eliminate the sanctuaries that these insurgent and extremist groups had. But at the end of the day, as frustrating as that was, it was a better situation, I felt, than what was likely to happen. And I think that subsequent events have validated uh, that particular assessment. I think that what happened was not just heartbreaking, uh, but act, actually disastrous. Uh, you look at the situation of the Afghan people right now, uh, more than half are starving, half of the population can't contribute in any mean, meaningful way to the economy, they can't even leave the house without a male uh, guardian and all the rest of this. Um, and you have an ultra-fundamentalist group that's trying to take them back to a ninth century interpretation of Islam. Uh, I think there were alternatives, but that doesn't diminish in any way what you and all of the rest of us who were privileged to serve our country in uniform during that time did, not just tried to do, but actually did do uh, during our service there. Yep, the outcome's frustrating. Um, Iraq has been imperfect. It's actually had its ups and downs. It was in a very good place, actually, when we pulled our final combat troops out. And unfortunately, the same prime minister that you know was our partner during the surge uh, then took some very bad big ideas that took the Iraqi security forces' eyes off the Islamic State. They're able to reconstitute, you know, a caliphate and have to do it again. But again, that, had, that, that, that takes nothing away from what it is that you and uh, your fellow men and women in uniform did during your time uh, in the service and the fact that you volunteered to serve our country at a time of war. Um, yes, as I mentioned earlier, there are recruiting challenges. There's a whole variety of reasons for those. Part of it is maybe uh, that there's a bit of uh, dissatisfaction at the way that turned out and perhaps you know there's a question of what it would all mean was it worth it this kind of thing uh, I think the answer to that is that you served your country magnificently as did the vast majority uh, of those in uniform uh, and all Americans should be very very grateful to you and, and, and your entire generation and I certainly am having been privileged to lead it in combat more than any other uh, American commander so I, I guess that would be the answer and then to try to persuade those uh, who are you know, coming after you, if you will, that it would be a really great thing to stand on the shoulders of you and your fellow men and women in uniform um, and to experience what you did. I think, I, obviously, there's, there's no perfection there. You know, it's, all, it's frustrating as well. Um, I don't want to idealize military service any more than you idealize any other walk in life, but um, it's a pretty special experience. You've had it, and that can never be taken away from you. Uh, and again, to, to serve one's country, especially at a time of war, uh, is something that is very, very special. And I think to persuade others of the wisdom, again, of raising their right hands, of the right, uh, that that is a noble action, without, again, trying to idealize this over much. Um, but it, again, I'll just keep coming back to that it's, it's very, very special. Uh, and we need to convince other Americans that that is the case uh, and then help them uh, find their way to that path, uh, even if it means helping them get in shape uh, so they can actually be all they can be as a Marine. <laughs> 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 <Semper Bob. laughs>